if you go to the bookstore and look for books on gravity, there's maybe four or five on the shelf. Look for books on stars, there's maybe six. You look for books on consciousness, there's shelf after shelf after <laughs> shelf after shelf. That means we know nothing about it, okay? Because once you know, it's done, no more books are necessary, and you move on to the next problem. Don't be confused by the volume of what is written. The, the, the current discourse doesn't seem to care what is objectively true or not. People will want something to be true because it feels good, whether or not it is true. And the only way I can parody that is to comment that just because perhaps you gained a kilo of weight last week doesn't mean you can protest the law of gravity because it did not serve your needs. This is, doesn't work that way. So, so I, I worry that so much of what I do is not advancing people's understanding of their relationship to how the universe works, but it's just sort of holding on. Do you remember in the old days, the old variety shows, there'd be somebody who'd be spinning discs on long sticks? Do you remember this? And they would just run around, and if they were successful, it meant no plates fell. That was success, <laughs> but it was a constant effort, spinning plates. And so I don't know. I, I cannot speak with confidence. I can only say what level of energy I'm investing in this. And by the way, I think the press has to participate in, an, in a way that understands what we're saying. And I'll give an example. Often when there's a new discovery, especially in physics, the first line of the newspaper article will say, oh, scientists have to go back to the drawing board because their cherished theories are now challenged. As though we're sitting in our office with our legs up, not thinking, just basking in our mastery of the universe. No. You do, you, you do a bit of that, though, don't well, you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that image in my mind now of you, no. uh, the Hayden Planetary. No, and I've said this before, that there, there, there are... If you are an active research scientist, you are always at the drawing board, at the chalkboard. And, and you revel in a new idea that will challenge your idea. Because that means things are ready to move forward. That's the most exciting time. Not some time we worry about. We might use the word worry, I, I worry. But at the end of the day, behind closed doors, it's the most exciting thing that can happen. And with the Higgs boson, the great search for that, and ultimately discovered it by the Large Hadron Collider, it would have been almost as interesting if they had searched that same parameter space and didn't find the Higgs boson. Hmm. Then it's like, oh my gosh, all of this that requires that it be there has to be reassessed. Yes, people would go back to it, but they would do it gleefully. We got the Big Bang. That's been going for a while. Now, not everybody's happy with the Big Bang. You found, found this billboard. So, so, so apparently, God isn't happy with the Big Bang. I would have thought he'd be totally cool with it, but apparently not. Our, I found this bumper sticker in New Mexico. The Big Bang Theory, God spoke, bang, it happens. This one is okay with the Big Bang, but that God did the Big Bang. So people are still trying to wrestle with this. Uh, here's what we know. This is the entire universe in one slide. Quantum fluctuations, birth, an entire explosion, rapid, explan uh, rapid expansion, we call it inflation. That's an idea that came about in the 1970s when there was inflation, <laughs> severe inflation in our economy. So the word had a lot of currency back then. Now it's like, are you inflating a tire? Like, what are you doing, you know? Um, there is the, the baby picture of the universe. That's that sort of aqua surface there. That's sort of the imprint of what happened in the very earliest moments, writ in the background sky. There it is, the cosmic microwave background. 
a record of the earliest moments of the Big Bang. Then it takes a little time to make your first stars. We call it the Dark Ages. Stars are made, galaxies are made, galaxies mature. We come up to the present day, 13.7 billion years later, and that telescope, we can't see the whole name, it's called WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe. They clearly didn't want anyone to pronounce that or remember it. I would just call it the Big Bang Machine. Uh, that made this measurement. And so it's a pretty coherent picture that we have of the origin of the universe. And here's that map that the, the uh, space probe shown. And so this is a record of the earliest moments of the universe. And it tells us what the universe was up to. And data, agree we're all pretty happy with this and we're kind of moving on. Um, I read a book, Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But he attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, his source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed... Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. So when a child sings or used to sing, I don't think they do anymore. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. It's not twinkling. Something powerful, dramatic, and dynamic is happening to it, right? <laughs> well, yes, and we call that twinkling. Yeah, so, right. yeah, there's starlight coming billions of, uh, or millions of light years, well, it depends on if it's a gal, but hundreds of thousands of light years across space, and it's a perfect point of light as it hits our atmosphere. Turbulence in the atmosphere jiggle the image and it renders the star a twinkling. And by the way, planets are brighter than stars typically, like Jupiter and, and Venus. Venus has been in the evening skies lately. And uh, if you go twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, and you, w I want, you want to wish upon the star, most people are wishing on planets. <laughs> right. That's why the wishes don't come true. <laughs> the planets are the first stars to come out at night. Don't you sometimes feel uh, sad about breaking all these myths apart. <laughs> no, no, because I, I, I think it's uh, some myths are, are, are deserve to be broken apart out of respect for the human intellect. That um, no, when you're writhing on the ground and froth is coming out of your mouth, you're having an epileptic seizure. You have not been invaded by the devil. We got this one figured out, okay? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> discovery moves on. So I, I don't mind the power of myth and magic, and, but take it to the next frontier and apply it there. Don't apply it in places where we've long passed what we already know what's going on. Do I believe in UFOs or extraterrestrial visitors? I'm not authorized to answer that question. <laughs> um, where shall I begin? Um, UFO. First, remember what the U stands for in UFO. Now, there's a fascinating frailty of the human mind that psychologists know all about. And it's called argument from ignorance. And this is how it goes. 
You ready? Somebody sees lights flashing in the sky. They've never seen it before. They don't understand what it is. They say, a UFO. The U stands for unidentified. So they say, I don't know what it is. It must be aliens from outer space visiting from another planet. <laughs> well, if you don't know what it is, that's where your conversation should stop. You don't then say, it must be anything. Okay? That's what argument from ignorance is. It's common. I'm not blaming anybody. Psychologists know all about it. And it may relate to our burning need to have to know stuff because we're uncomfortable steeped in ignorance. You can't be a scientist if you're uncomfortable with ignorance because we live at the boundary between what is known and unknown in the universe. Unlike what journalists write, you ever see journalists? They, any journalists here? <laughs> you go to journalists. <laughs> you go to journalists. All articles about science discoveries begin. Scientists now have to go back to the drawing board. As though we're sitting up in our office, you know, <laughs> masters of the universe. It's like, oops, somebody discovered something. No, we're always at the drawing board. If you're not at the drawing board, you're not making discoveries. You're something else. So, the public, it appears, seems to have this burning need to have to have an answer to what is unknown. And so you go from an abject statement of ignorance to an abject statement of certainty. So, that is operating within us. Let's start there. Second, we know, not only from research in psychology, but simple empirical evidence in the history of science, that the lowest form of evidence that exists in this world is eyewitness testimony. <laughs> Which is scary because that's some of the highest form of evidence in the court of law. Yeah, that's better music here. <whistles> the face on Mars. Da, 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 da. So everybody got excited. Well, sorry, not everybody. Those people who were sure that life on Mars had a simian face. Okay? I mean, think about it. Most life on Earth does not have a simian face. Uh, most life on Earth doesn't have a face, all right? So, so, life with which we have DNA in common. All life on Earth has DNA in common. Are you gonna go to another planet and it has a face? Uh, the, only, the only things on Earth that have faces are like vertebrates have faces. That's a vertebrate face. So you want to say that there are vertebrates on Mars and there's simian in their biology. Well, there's only one thing that looks like a face, no matter the camera angle. And what is that? A face, yes. So we go back at another time, uh, and this is what it is at another time with higher resolution. It looks less like a face. You can kind of see how it might have been. Now all the Mars fanatics said, oh, the Martians figured out we were looking at them and they quickly covered up the, the monument. Then you go back again and it's like even less like a face. So the Martians have continued to cover this up apparently. So more on that later. But in fact, I do have the first evidence from the rovers. This photo, in fact, has been kept from the public till I have special connections to NASA, as you heard in the introduction. So this one was the first image taken by the rovers, and it's been suppressed by NASA ever since. Right. <laughs> so um, I thought I'd share it with you guys, because, like, you know, you're my people tonight here. By the way, if you're looking on Mars for faces, why not look for other things that are familiar? You know, you only see that as a face because we have a face. And you, familiar things are what you pick out, even if they're not really there, right? When you look up in the clouds, you don't say, oh, I see a lobster. No. Has anyone ever said they see a lobster? In the, no, you say, I see Abe Lincoln or George Washington. You're looking at sort of familiar iconography of our culture. And so let's find some more familiar iconography in the Martian terrain. There's the Valentine crater, there you go. We got one of those. How about the smiley face crater, right? <laughs> so 
if you look hard enough, you can find stuff and call it whatever you want. Since you are our future, I want you to understand something and not forget it. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Religions all over the world constitutes what we call belief systems. Okay? And your freedom to believe whatever you want is a right and even a privilege in a free society. That's a good thing. Consider, however, that if you believe something that's part of a religious philosophy, and someone else has a different religion that's a different religious philosophy, and you're not agreeing with one another, and there's another religion over here, and another over here, and they don't agree, you're still free to believe what you want. But what that tells you is that it is unstable to build a government on a belief system. What you want is, what you want is objectively verifiable truths around which we can all agree. That's what you build your economic system on, your governance on. Once you have that, then you go forth to your mosques, to your churches, and to your go forth and preach and believe whatever you want. But know the difference, as Galileo did, between how to go to heaven and how the heavens go. That's why I answer to you. Because I don't give a rat's ass whether we share each other's opinion or not about anything. I don't care. And my Twitter stream has no opinions in it at all. I mean, if there's one, it's one in a hundred tweets will smack of some opinion of another. But that is not my MO. Most people with that platform are pundits who have strong opinions or, or they're, they, they're parts of movements and they want you to join that movement. You have never seen me debate people. You've never seen me at the front of movements holding up placards. You've never seen me arguing with politicians. It's not what I do. We had Benjamin Carson recently saying that, that well, not re I mean, it's in his, in his video log. It's that um, evolution is a fairy tale, okay? And so this is a, not a particularly scientifically literate posture. Um, <laughs> and so do I get angry with him? He is representing voters. In a free society, people can vote for wherever they want. If they want to vote for someone who thinks that evolution's a fairy tale, that is their right and it is their privilege. As an educator, I will alert the electorate that if you want to think that evolution is a fairy tale, that has consequences to the economic health of the nation in which you live. Because innovations in science and technology are the engines of tomorrow's economy. If you want to accept it as your religion, that's fine, but you swap it into your science class, you are undermining the role that science plays. I, I just gave you information. It's an if-then. If you do this, this will happen. It's not do this because I say so. Don't do anything because I say so. That's cult building. <laughs>